I'm Lawrence Francis, host of Interpreting Wine, the place to learn from thought leaders in the world of wine and marketing, welcoming you to a specially commissioned episode with Peter Dillon, chief winemaker at Handpicked Wines. They make regionally expressive and site-specific wines, not only from vineyards in Australia, but also from around the world. Today, we really focus in on Australia, in what I'm sure is some of the most detailed content anywhere, talking about the Yarra Valley and the Mornington Peninsula. The three wines we tried today, as well as two others, will be available to try at the London Wine Fair from Tuesday 7th to Thursday 9th of June. Handpicked wines will be in the Wines and Earth section at stand X114A. They're actively seeking importation into the UK, so do be sure to stop by to taste if you're heading to the fair. We kick things off with an intro to handpicked wines. Before getting into Peter's origin story, he shares his day-to-day role as chief winemaker and talks us through the company's vineyard acquisitions. Before getting into Australian wine perceptions in 2022 and winemaking culture, The first wine we try is the regional selections Pinot Noir 2018 from Yarra Valley, which Peter then uses as the basis for a virtual journey from High Bow Hill to Wombat Creek, the two sites where the fruit from the wine is sourced from. He also covers the geology of the two vineyards, as well as winemaking in Handpicked's regional series. The second wine we try is the single vineyard Chardonnay 2018, all the fruit coming from the Wombat Creek vineyard. Before trying the third wine, the collection series Pinot Noir 2019 from the Mornington Peninsula, which we then use as the basis for a discussion of the Mornington Peninsula geology. We close things off talking about viticulture at Handpick Wines, their sustainable approaches, before looking ahead to their appearance at the London Wine Fair 2022. Enjoy! Peter Dillon from Handpicked Wines um, as the chief winemaker. I wear a couple of different hats, so uh, otherwise also known as the director of winemaking and viticulture. Um, I suppose Handpicked Wines is a pretty um, interesting and diverse story in terms of, of wine businesses in that we are probably not cut from the, the normal cloth of a, of a wine business. Um, at face value, we're, we're probably trying to achieve similar things to others we we really are trying to focus on making premium wines that that offer uh, a true sense of place Uh, but fundamentally i think the big difference is we are not based in one place Um, i I come to you this evening from mornington peninsula sitting in the winery um, surrounded by a vineyard here Uh, but it's one of, of a number of vineyards that we we operate across a number of different regions um, I'm sure there are other businesses that would would deal with with multiple regions and things like that. But the reality is, we're we're not a, a large corporation. We're a, we're a small independent producer, um, and uh, we are driven by the vision of um, our founder and our owner, William Dong, uh, who was mid university uh, in the UK doing actuarial science, um, which I think is a lot of fairly high-powered mathematics. And when he had some downtime, was heavily involved in some of the wine clubs at the university. And I think probably in many ways that was a a lightning bolt of realisation where he realised that he was actually pretty interested in wine. Um, And and if we then fast Mm -hmm. forward a few years, here we are today um, and – and we're we're underway with with six of our own vineyards spread across Australia, uh, and a pretty um, diverse portfolio of growers, um, which which in reality spread from um, the far west of Australia in Margaret River, um, right through to New Zealand, and, and even some international projects, including uh, making some Pinot in Oregon uh, and places like that. Um, but but fundamentally, uh, we really are interested in what is unique and, and, and special about those places. Um, and I suppose, therefore, my job is trying to, to find that um, thread of a story that, that, that comes out of those, those sites and vineyards and um, allow it to express itself in a, a unique and, and clear way so that we can um, enjoy the wines that come from those sites. We're coming up to our 10th anniversary of the first vineyard that was bought, 
Um, so I probably think really yeah. that's the the really big um, anniversary. William, when he first started, he had a couple of years there where he was um, trying to get things up and running. He didn't have um, the resources at that point to have the vineyards and the wineries, so he was operating with mm. some some mm -hmm. key winemakers around Australia. Uh, so it, it was, there are a number of years where he's going before the first vineyard, but I think really the key anniversary will be um, 2023, which is 10 years of owning the Capella Vineyard in Mornington Peninsula, where I'm coming from. It would be really helpful and really interesting for me and the listener to get a little sense of, of yourself and your background and your understanding, because, um, you know, presumably for, uh, yeah, a, a relatively ambitious project like that, to get in a, a chief winemaker, you you know you need to have somebody there that has a you know real um, high level appreciation, but I'm sure also have had the boots on the ground in in uh, you know in various vintages at, at various times in the past as well. So I think just yeah, un unpicking a bit about you know your background would be would be really cool. Yeah, sure. So in a personal sense, uh, this year I think was about my 23rd harvest in an Australian um, winery. Uh, I've done a few around the world as well. Um, but really where I started was um, being inspired to study winemaking at the University of Adelaide. Um, it used to be called the Roseworthy course, uh, which was out on the Barossa, but the Uni of Adelaide moved it to the Waite campus. Uh, so that's where I studied. And that was probably a result of um, wine always being a part of that fabric of, around the family dinner table. Um, but I was also probably inspired by a grandmother who was one of the Lindemann family and grew up in the Hunter Valley just north of Sydney. Uh, and she spoke very fondly of her time uh, growing up in the industry there and I think in many ways sowed the seed uh, for, to inspire me to then think along those lines. Um, Adelaide uh, is right in the, the centre of the country and is surrounded by probably some of the most uh, well-recognised Australian regions like Barossa and McLaren Vale. Um, and it really is a city which has an incredible wine and food culture. So, you know, as a young student, um, not necessarily um, brimming with cash, it was still an incredible place to, to go out and, um, and be exposed to great wine. Um, I was working at um, a quite famous bottle shop called Edinburgh Cellars, which the alumni of employees there um, makes my name probably pale by comparison. You know, that's a long history of, of really um, interesting um, people who've, who've gone through the doors there and, and worked as staff. And, and that, I think, also really opened my eyes to um, the wines of Australia, but also the world. And in, in many ways, really probably got me mm. hooked on Pinot Noir. Um, I remember trying some of the, um, the uh, Muradak wines uh, from Mornington Peninsula and just being blown away by this wine I'd never seen before. Um, from there, I was also working part-time in McLaren Vale with wineries like Durenberg and Kangarilla um, through the degree, uh, which was about four years. And then on completion of that, um, in retrospect, I'm surprised I, I didn't end up dealing with Pinot Noir straight away, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I moved west uh, to West Australia and I had actually 12 years uh, there. I initially went thinking I'd do one vintage and then perhaps go to Barolo for a vintage, but um, I had too much fun and, and the wines were so diverse and, and interesting I stayed. Uh, and I, I moved around um, the west of Australia and there's quite a lot of, of wine regions spread across the state down that southwestern corner. Um, but mm -hmm. where I started was a winery called Horton, which at the time was one of the, the bigger um, brands and wineries there and, and a part of what then was BRL Hardy, um, which were a pretty inspirational group of people to work for. So at that time uh, there was people like Peter Dawson in charge of, of the winemaking side of things at BRL Hardy. Um, and I think he was a real mentor in terms of the, the influences there. Uh, and a guy called Larry Cherubino was running Horton. Um, and that really exposed me to an incredible diversity um, of, of wines from across the whole of that southwestern corner. Uh, and I ended up in some roles where I was running um, some wineries which were dealing with fruit from from across that, that part of the countryside and, and travelling a huge amount 
across all those vineyards and looking at the fruit and, and following it through to the winery. So a um, pretty interesting role. And, and I think Beryl Hardy was also interesting. It, it, um, it's evolved into an, a couple of different entities since then, um, but, but they had an incredible focus on wine culture. And as a senior winemaker in that business, you know, I would, I would come back to the south of Australia to their McLarenville winery at Tintara um, and get really involved with um, wines from across their their business, including places like uh, Tasmania, Clare Valley, uh, Yarra Valley and all those sorts of things. So without really knowing it, it, it was probably the perfect um, foundation for um, yeah. the future that I would see in this role because – the industry, uh, you know, across the world is a small one uh, and it's amazing how many times I'll see a parcel of fruit from a vineyard that I'll recognise from a tasting that I did 10 or 15 years ago at the tasting room in Tintara. Um, so it's um, it's always sort of makes me smile. I think it is a, a small world when it comes to the world of the wine industry. Really interesting, Pete, to get the context and background to where you've come from. And I wonder if now we could fast forward the almost eight years now to since you joined Handpicked Wines, where you oversee operations from the vineyard through to the winery, and maybe, yeah, start to unpick more about what exactly does that entail. So in terms of how we operate at the moment, it's obviously been a slightly um, interesting or challenging couple of years with the uh, the arrival of COVID and the pandemic. Um, and, and it probably has made me have to pause a couple of the more complex projects in some way, shape or form. But um, in, a, in a normal sense, which I think we're, we're coming back towards now and, and where we certainly were pre-2020, um, mm -hmm. I would probably be operating in a manner that um, would, for many would be seen as reasonably hands-on. So um, obviously mm. plenty of, plenty of de desk work still involved but uh, um, I do get pretty heavily involved in particularly the vineyards especially through uh, that period of pre pre pick at, at the harvest time because I really think getting those nuances right to that nth degree really makes that that big difference at the, at the winemaking side of things um, and then you know I've got a, a small team around me um, and, and it just depends a little bit as to what's going on. And, and there's always, you know, no vintage or harvest is ever the same. So, um, you know, it, it's almost a bit of a, a triage process where you have to identify those um, those key issues to resolve or, or, or key quality parcels of fruit that need the attention and then we'll, we'll divide up who's going where at what time. Um, and what that will mean is that in a given week, I may well start it in Tasmania uh, and then mm -hmm. the next day be in Mornington and the day after be in Yarra Valley and then uh, the day after that I'll be on the plane to South Australia to look at our um, McLaren Vale or Barossa fruit. Um, and other weeks I might spend mm -hmm. the whole week in, in Mornington at the winery. Um, and um, it, it, so really it, there's no hard and fast rule. It will just depend a bit. Uh, and then, of course, um, no vintage ever goes perfectly to plan. So there will be other instances where I'll be in Tasmania, a viticulturalist will be in McLaren Vale and, um, and our winemaker Rowan Smith will be up in the air. So we have to sort of divide and conquer at times as well. In terms of handpicks process for, for how we choose these vineyards, it it's really is a desire to focus perhaps um, on these super premium regions. But Underlying that, there's also very much you can you, you can probably see that um, preference for cool climate, and and uh, there is a core of fruit around things like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, but mm -hmm. but that's not exclusive. You know, we do have uh, the vineyard in the Barossa um, because it is such an iconic region. Uh, I think um, William felt that 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 was a, a crucial component to to include. Um, we do include things like the um, McLaren Vale Shiraz in our regional selection range. Um, and and I think um, it's evolved as a gradual process. So 2013 mm. really was a pivotal year in terms of um, taking that big step in terms of investment in vineyards. 
Uh, so 2013 mm-hmm. saw the purchase of our flagship property, which is Capella in the Mornington Peninsula. And then in that same year, we also picked up uh, Hybo Hill Vineyard, which is in the lower Yarra or Yarra Valley. Uh, and we picked up the Watunga Vineyard, which is on the valley floor in the Barossa Valley. So that was um, really that crucial year mm-hmm. where um, where things happened very quickly. Uh, and, and really, I think that was a recognition of the importance of just having um, ownership and control over those sites in order to, to really drive that, that process of making the best wines that we could. Um, nothing ever stands still at handpick wines, and I suppose we're always thinking about those next steps. So um, mm-hmm. we took a little bit of time to, to distill what, what had happened there and, and what the next directions would be. Um, but those initial three vineyards were then joined um, by Wombat Creek, which is a vineyard in the Yarra Valley, uh, right at the top of the valley. That's one of the highest planted sites there in 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was on the back of, of buying some fruit from the original owners in 2016 and just being um, completely blown away. So, um, so that was an easy decision to make. Yeah. Uh, and then the following two years, 18 and 19, saw the purchase of our two Tasmanian sites, um, starting with one called Auburn Road, uh, which is right up the top of the Tamar uh, River, up the northern end of Tasmania. Um, and, um, and, and that, you know, is, is quickly becoming one of our favourite sites. It's really um, quite phenomenal in terms of what that's producing. Uh, and in 19, we picked up a vineyard called Native Point, which was actually uh, the purchase of a vineyard that was owned by a grower that we'd been buying fruit from for some time, and they were looking to uh, step back from that. So that was a very, very easy and fluid sort of process, I suppose, uh, in terms of the decision to, to pick up that property. Uh, and where we go from next, uh, we'll, we'll wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, it sounds as though... From what I'm hearing, yeah, it's it, it's very much um, you, you had the opportunity uh, to 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 sample fruit to to even make wine from from um, vineyards and and yeah, maybe then it gives you the um, the desire to to bring this into the portfolio. Exactly, yeah, I think, and I think that's yeah. probably was you know for myself. Um, you can see how, as, as someone sitting in Margaret River, um, realizing that that I really uh, was infatuated with Pinot Noir, it was an easy decision to to join the business, and because we just have so many options in terms of the Pinots that, and, and wines in general that we're making in the portfolio, um, mm. and you can see there's a bit of bit of a, a range there. I mean, we have the regional selection that's um, sitting at around um, twenty pounds. A bottle, uh, and that is really looking to uh, really show the typicity of those classic varieties from those regions. Uh, from there, we go mm-hmm. up to the collection mm-hmm. range at around thirty-five pounds a bottle, um, and mm-hmm. then up to single vineyard at fifty. Uh, and there's also another tier of um, a very small uh, release, which we only uh, release on occasion, uh, which we call the numbered series. Uh, and that's actually sitting at 270 pounds a bottle. I'm super excited today because, as I think I've mentioned before, I've not really covered Australia in, in any great detail um, on the podcast. And, and it's fantastic to to be able to you know, really dive into that continent and, and really yeah, understand, I guess, yeah, the, the, the state of Australian wine from somebody who's got their their feet in uh, many different soils and, uh, you know, is obviously, uh, you know, an, an experienced winemaker and uh, very experienced with the with the market there. So, yeah, I wonder if you wouldn't just give us a sense of, um, yeah, your your um, understanding and, and your experience of, of where Australia is now and, and, and maybe, you know, through the lens of its fine wine and its perception abroad. Sure. Thanks, Lawrence. I, I mean, I think it is an interesting point because, I think historically, um, perhaps particularly in that UK market, uh, there has been something of the legacy of, of um, labelling Australian wine that really is, is in some ways mass-produced and um, a lot of that lower value, uh, large volume 
style winemaking. And I think it, it's um, it's obviously been there in that format. But I think really the story of what Australian wine is has so much more to offer. And I think for me, it's really about just shifting that perception and, and understanding. And I think really it is probably epitomised to me by the difference in scales and and you know, as an Australian winemaker dealing in all these different regions, we see um, what to us is is quite a big and complex region with nuances of sub-regionality and, and all those other layers, even before we get to our own vineyard or, or block or parcel of fruit. And um, I think, you know, if we put it in perspective, something like the region, I mean, now Mornington Peninsula, um, the reality is it's only 1,000 hectares of um, planted under vine. Um, Yarra Valley mm-hmm. is only two and a half thousand hectares, and if we compare that to something like Burgundy, which is sitting at twenty five thousand hectares, I think it really gives you an idea of that that that, that difference there. You know, the, and and obviously I say that as someone who loves Burgundy, but but really um, the scale is is hugely different. Uh, and similarly in Margaret River, uh, which you know many people would would know and and recognise as one of the great. Cabernet regions for Australia. Um, that's only five thousand hectares uh, compared to to Bordeaux at over a hundred thousand. Um, so I think I think mm-hmm. the future is bright in terms of really drilling into just how um, niche some of these regions are, and and really um, mm-hmm. you know the, the future of, of, of expanding on that. I guess there's also a huge diversity there, and 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 for us as a business, it's been quite an interesting narrative to to try to to relay that and and get the consumers to understand that. Um, so as a business, you know, we've yeah. probably um, found a different path for that. We are not like the typical winery that would have a cellar door on site between the, the vineyard and the winery. Um, and I suppose for a lot of people that would be an easier process because you're all in one place. Um, so we've actually decided mm-hmm. to have more of an urban cellar door. Um, so we started mm-hmm. with one in Sydney uh, and then um, just a couple of years ago opened in Melbourne as well. Uh, and really that was all that um, concept of of probably really taking the wines to the customers and really um, um, taking them on something of an educational pathway and journey to to see the differences in those yeah. regions and, and the complexity and layers once we, we drill into that region and look at the, the, the what might be a sub-region or a, or a difference between two vineyards at, at opposite ends of the region, et cetera. Somewhere like the Yarra Valley um, has gone through quite an interesting phase in its evolution where it was similar to Mornington. It had uh, plantings going in in the um, 1830s uh, and then really through to the Great Depression in the sort of 1920s, 1930s, there were pretty hard times. Um, society, in certainly in an Australian sense, was more interested in fortifieds, all those sorts of things meant things really ground to a big halt in the era. It really started with, with vigour in the 60s and got back up in terms of table wine. But in more recent times, so the, about 20 years ago, Phylloxera arrived in the valley which was previously phylloxera free and largely planted on own roots. Um, so the, the region there's seen this um, necessity for change um, starting at that vineyard level. And I think that's quite interesting to watch mm-hmm. too where mm-hmm. obviously it, it's something that everyone would prefer perhaps not to have to do or, or be forced to do uh, as the phylloxera spreads. But I think what what it you know the flip side of that coin is to say, um, there's plenty of investment in uh, removal of those um, initial vines and, and planting the replacement blocks. And it gives people that opportunity to really think about where does the future lie? You know, what mm. what's mm. the new era hold? What, what's the direction? What's the, are we going to plant with the same varieties or different? Thinking about climate change, uh, rootstock clones, all those sort of things. And I, I think that makes it a really... Um, uh, and there's, there's a lovely energy there around what perhaps could be a, a negative is actually a real positive as well. Yeah, incredible. And uh, you know, you've, you've you've brought up you know one of my favourite topics really, which is again you know going 
behind the stereotypes really you know because as you say it, it, it's very easy to to kind of yeah paint you know in these in these um, you know very broad brush strokes you know and 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 say you know new world wine is made like that old world wine is made like that mm. um but really it's not it's not that simple is it you know and i think i think your specific um mentions there of the of the sizes and you know what what we're dealing with i think i think certainly does does give an insight into that the other element that i'm always very taken with as well is is actually the relative youth of winemaking in those different regions as well you know yeah. i mean as you say you know burgundy we can you know go go back um you know to the cistercian monks and we can you know literally go back centuries <laughs> and um you know the, the the history isn't isn't so much there um in 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 regions that you mentioned but but i think for me there's there's also um the, 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 there's there's a different feel to that because actually you know some of the the pioneers the people who made those first plantings are still alive or, or or certainly their their impact is 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 kind of still alive as well and and i wonder if you know maybe um you know through the through the lens of of that um yeah that that sort of consumer experience is that is that something that you you are able to to kind of share with the consumer as well just you know how how sort of yeah still evolving the 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 wine scene is in australia i think it's definitely part of the story and i, I think you know, Mornington Peninsula is quite a good example of that where I think, mm. you know, if we really wanted to drill into it, you could say that there were some vine plantings in 1886, et cetera, et cetera, but, but really um, they were, were relatively short-lived. Um, there was a planting uh, by a fairly famous Australian business called Sepult in the 50s, uh, but it only lasted a little more than a decade before it was burnt down by a bushfire and then not much happened in Mornington mm. until the early 70s. Uh, at that point, there was almost a small sort of explosion of activity, um, and as you say, there were there were these sort of key families that that came down and and set up um, shop o- often as in some ways, um, perhaps a side project or, or whatever else, uh, which mm-hmm. evolved to become uh, their raison to be, you know, and 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 as you say, those families still are here and. Um, and mm-hmm. and you know forty to fifty years later, it's quite fascinating to sit around a table and and hear those stories and 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 see how things have evolved. Where, you know, in a morning peninsula sense, um, there's now probably some clarity around Chardonnay and Pinot Noir being a real focus for the region. Um, whereas back in at that point, you know, there was um, a hive of activity and perhaps. Um, not quite the clarity or, or or whatever else, and some of those early plantings included quite a bit of things like Cabernet Sauvignon, etc., which um, you know I think at that point um, didn't didn't last too long and, and was replaced and uh, and not so much a focus now. Also on that culture point, really, I mean, I think you know another another one of those, uh, yeah, maybe stereotypes around again, yeah, the sort of uh, new world or, or newer. Um, growing regions is, is is that kind of use of technology you know i think i think um people often you know try to put that forward uh, and 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 maybe it's not put forward as a as a particularly romantic um view mm. and, and uh yeah as you say it, it, it's it kind of leads people down the the scale side of things but it, it sounds as though in your day to day and you know and certainly during the uh the harvest um you know it sounds as though you may well be using technology and you may well have um diverse teams but you actually want to be there on the ground and to and to kind of yeah get a get a sense of when the when the right time is to pick and 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 really you know understand intuitively what's going on in those vineyards to make your life easier i guess in the future when it comes to to making the wine most definitely and i think i think in many ways um you know, as a winemaker, there's so often different avenues or there's no one pathway to get to an end destination. And I suppose you could mm. you could have 10 winemakers in the room and they'll, they'll probably all give you a different path, which will no doubt get you to that final destination point. It might look a little bit different mm-hmm. depending <laughs> perhaps on, on different things. But I think, um, you know, it's also an interesting industry because um, – Often people will come up with what they think is a new idea, but in some ways 
it's perhaps an old idea that's been reinvigorated or or, or found again or, or whatever else. And I, I guess for me, that's mm-hmm. one of the fun things about winemaking. You know, there's there's no one way to do anything, and and perhaps no one ever really knows the perfect way, and, and it's worth trying all sorts of different things. And and we, you know, as a as a as a winery, we try to remember that at the back of our minds, and um, um, and even you know when we talk touched on things like the cellar door, we do a range for cellar door called trial batch, uh, which from our side it's about letting those regular customers try new things and keep them interested and engaged, uh, and and probably you know you could almost say from a slightly selfish point of view, it's also about letting our team try new things it's almost like that sort of um mm. chef having the test kitchen out the back where it's not really the main winery and it's it's allowing you to to play around with ideas um sometimes they work sometimes they don't um but you know i, I think an interesting example of that is to say um we take a really um uh, interesting parcel of reasoning and we'll actually put it across um, a range of different fermenters that we have, which will be, um, you know, mm. some eggs. Uh, so the fermenter number one might be a, a terracotta egg uh, from, from from Spain. Two might be a, a ceramic egg um, from Australia in a place called Byron Bay. Uh, and thirdly, we might mm-hmm. have a concrete egg from France. And we, we can just see what are the differences in terms of that um, – composition of the, the the fermenter vessel and and what impact will it have on the wine and um and and perhaps take away some learnings from that which we might apply to how we make our other wines um out in the in the greater winery which um as a rule that's 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 worked quite well we we found that really interesting with raising uh to the point where we ended up um using a a particularly um, interesting Tasmanian parcel of raising off our native point vineyard now goes into the concrete egg every year. Um, mm-hmm. Similarly, this year we're playing around with with Pinot and, and thinking, you know, the winery by and large uh, was built in the classic Australian way, which is stainless steel fermenters. That's what 99% of people would have. Um, but this year we actually had a parcel of our Mornington fruit, uh, Pinot, Across all those same eggs, and and a um, uh, along with a puncheon uh, and some stainless steel, mm-hmm. so we had the full range, and then we had a parcel of fruit come off our Auburn Road um, vineyard, which was also Pinot, and we did the same procedure. And you know, I think all those things just go to show that um, there's no one way to do anything, and not necessarily a right or a wrong, but you can get some really different outcomes as a result. So, so ultimately, we're really pleased, and and at the back of my mind, I'm thinking I might have to um, get some different fermenters for the winery. <laughs> so, in terms of tasting some wine, we probably should start with the regional selection from the Yarra Valley, which is the 2018. Um, this this range of wines or, or tier for us really is trying to demonstrate those classic varieties. Uh, from from these regions, so Pinot Noir really is um, one of the key red varieties in the Yarra Valley, um, and this is a you know there, there's probably different layers to the story around this particular wine, um, but for us this is a combination of, of two of our sites. So um, about one third of this wine comes from a vineyard called Wombat Creek which is right up the top of the valley, uh, so would be deemed to be Upper Yarra. Uh, and the balance comes from our other site called Hybo Hill, which is um, right at the opposite end of the valley. So it takes me about probably 40 minutes to drive between the two. Uh, and generally, as I come down the valley, it'll drop about five degrees, um, which is associated with a, a roughly about a, um, uh, a 200 metre drop in altitude. Um, so you get this real, um, I would say, typicity in terms of character of the Yarra, but at the same time you've got this combination of fruit characteristics. So we'll have a quick look. Um, not, not sure if you want the authentic uh, cracking of the, the stove. <laughs> yeah, we, we will. 
leave leave, leave a bit of yeah ambient sounds in and the <laughs> and and to me in tasting this wine um I, I see that combination of characteristics of the two sites coming together. So to me, mm. um, to give you an idea, because that, that lower site just has that extra element of warmth, I tend to see more of those black fruits coming from that site. Um, so quite a savoury spice uh, and some of that darker cherry nuance coming from Hobo Hill. Overlaying that is is the Wombat Creek fruit, um, which... You know, it's quite an interesting site. Being up a Yarra, it is classic in terms of having perfume uh, and probably a little bit more of that red fruited spectrum uh, that is there. But I think um, what is different about it is that it's quite old vines. It's 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 one of those early vineyards to be planted in the upper Yarra, uh, and at the time, the original owners uh, actually planted it to be a sparkling site. Um, Mm. Um, which has evolved over since the late 80s to the point now where possibly with climate change, we're thinking of it more as a, a table wine site. Um, but but often people would see Upper Yarra as being probably more tension, tighter, finer. Um, mm-hmm. But but mm-hmm. but an underlying factor there too is the vine age. So I sort of see that coming through in terms of concentration and, and a bit more layer and and substance to it than you might otherwise suspect amazing and uh yeah you've you've set me up there really for one of my um favorite questions um <laughs> when you mentioned driving between the the two sites and uh, you know given that i've never been to the Arab valley yep. i've never been to um you know that 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 those growing sites obviously um could you yet give us a sense of on that drive down and i guess at different times of the day um, like, what are you seeing? What does it actually look like there? What 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 is the the type of environment that that you find yourself in, and that we're tasting the wine from? Well, perhaps we might do the journey the other way around because for me that's probably um, mm. more more reminiscent of I, okay. the first time I, I remember driving up to Wombat. It was quite is etched in my mind. It, it's quite an impressive mm-hmm. uh, drive. So as we start in that lower portion of the valley where where Hobo Hill is. Um, it's mm. more rolling, folded hills. Um, there's still the Yarra Ranges surrounding us on on different sides of the valley, which have got covered in eucalypt um, bush forest. Mm. But but being in that sort of valley floor, um, it's it's more shaped possibly by the winding of the Yarra River. It's got a, a much flatter, broader floor closer to the river. And then as you, you start that climb, the, there's a shift in that landscape and it, the country becomes tighter. Um, and really what, you, what is happening is you're, you're going from the, the valley floor and up onto the edge of what's called the Great Dividing Range, which is this range of hills that go right up the, the side of the east coast of Australia from the, the, the southern point to the very top of, um, of Queensland. Mm-hmm. Um, and you get this huge change in landscape due to things like the um, orographic rainfall effect where, you know, the weather's coming in from that western side, it hits this big range of mountains and it drops all this rainfall. So Wombat Creek as a site, as an example, gets over a metre of rainfall a year, whereas Hobo Hill gets closer mm-hmm. to 600 mil. Um, and what that means is it can support much more vegetation, much more bush um, and, and as you go up, you're going through the gullies, uh, which is actually almost like being in rainforest. It's, it's temperate rainforest, so you've still got the ferns and that really sort of tight vines. And, uh, and, and you know, if the, if the track wasn't there, you probably w- it would be hard work to get up there. Um, <laughs> and it's a dirt road uh, for, for the last sort of um, third of the, the trip and you're winding up. Um, you're almost expecting someone to be sitting on a porch playing a banjo sort of thing with a, a, a blade of grass in their mouth. Um, and then as you come up out of the gully and you really hit the side of the mountain, you get into the really big forest, which is um, mm-hmm. the really tall eucalypts and the tall mountain ash. And mountain ash is the tallest um, flowering tree in the Southern Hemisphere, I'm pretty sure. You know, it's 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 a really significant tree. Um, and... And you know they're um, 
you know, I'd probably struggle to put my arms around them. They're, they're that big. Um, and then as you get up to the top of the, the hill at about 420 metres, um, you come into the clearing of Wombat Creek. And that's where, mm, mm. Um, you know, it's like a window into the valley because you've been just surrounded by this, this amazing bush. You come into the clearing, the, 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 the sides of the hill descend um, from the driveway so you can see the mm. slopes of the vineyard, but you can also see almost right down the valley to Hybo Hill. Um, you, you probably couldn't mm. see quite that mm. far with the naked eye, but it's um, just this amazing um, window, as I say. And, you know, for me, the first time I went up there, um, the hair really stood up on the back of, you know, my arms. You could just sense that it was a, a special place. The other part of that story is to say, um, you know, Wombat Creek is um, it, it's that classic uh, Australian story, which we're probably trying to avoid in some ways about talking about the Australian critters. But um, wombats, uh, for those that are not aware of this marsupial that uh, lives in burrows and it, it can grow to a, over a metre in length so it's, um, and nearly sort of 50 kilos. So they're incredibly small, stocky almost like a furry sort mm. of pig. Um, and they love digging these massive burrows, which is probably a bit like 100 times the size of a rabbit burrow. So we have to actually be careful at Wombat mm. Creek driving the tractors down the row because um, if you get a tractor wheel going into one while you're trying to operate, it gets um, pretty scary for everyone. It also adds to that complexity of running organic vineyards because um, – we do have to try to manage and then deal with things because um, uh, not only do we have lots of wombats, which fortunately are short and can't really reach the vines, but there's lots of things like kangaroos and, and feral deer and they really make a big impact in terms of um, just eating the vine and fruit and all those sorts of things. So, uh, you know, it's certainly something we have to think about as to how to, to manage those sorts of things, running an organic um, operation on our, on our various sites. Really cool to get the the visual there and to yeah imagine myself I guess on the on the uh, on the four by four I guess it must be um, you know snaking our way up the up the valley there and and what we can see in terms of the yeah the sort of flora and fauna and uh, yeah we might might sort of see a see a wombat on our on our way up there as well. Um, but I think what would be super interesting and I think it it will absolutely lead us back to the wine that we've got in the glass here as well, would actually just be to understand, uh, yeah, what's going on underneath the soil really. And and maybe, you know, getting a sort of a, maybe a slightly longer term and, and potentially slightly shorter term view of how that particular landscape was formed and kind of what it's left behind in, in terms of the soil types. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think Australia as a landscape is, is a hundred percent seen as an older ancient landmass, um, mm. you know it's it's really got this incredibly old soils. They tend to be infertile, and that is a reflection of mm. um, the 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 unfolding of, of of what happened over various ice ages, where Australia tended not to be covered by the ice caps to the same extent as somewhere like Europe. Um, in terms of the Yarra specifically. Um, what we see there is a real um, mix of different um, geological events that have influenced that that landscape that we see today. And the reality is that mm. they've occurred over so many millions of years that it would be an incredibly complex um, story in its in, in in real detail. But I think what's interesting to me is if we look at the two vineyard sites and and what really you know distills them and why they are different. Um, aside from purely altitude, Hybo Hill is sitting on the edge of the, the Yarra River at, at the lower end of the valley, so it's um, ab around about 160 metres in altitude. Um, mm. That's got these really sandy loams, which are sitting um, on a clay or gravel over a very romantically uh, named rock, which is called mudstone. Um, and I think that really gives you the idea of, of what is the foundation for that landscape, and that's it's coming back to uh, millennia of, of um, inundation events with flooding, with rising sea levels, and, mm. and they've done mm. that periodically. 
along with that real flow of the Yarra River, which is, is quite a significant river um, for anyone who's travelled to Melbourne, it's the same river that, that flows right through the middle of the city. Um, and so that is this really sedimentary-based um, landscape, which is folded and, and they're still, it's not to say it's flat or anything like that. It, it's, you know, Hybo Hill has seen uplift and shaping, so it's it's got real undulation and variation of aspect and slope, but ultimately it's coming back to that really sed- sedimentary formation. Um, Wombat Creek is is really very different to that. Um, it's very volcanic in its origin, so it's a very, very deep volcanic loam that it's based on, so it's coming back to a degraded lava flow ultimately. And uh, probably what I'm not clear on is, is that an actual eruption that's formed like a volcano, and I don't think it is. I think we're talking about um, subterranean eruptions which are folding and then eroded and, and, and degraded. Um, but it looks, mm-hmm. it does look to the naked eye almost like that sort of, it's steep enough that you can imagine it being a volcano. Um, and what it also has is this, is this incredible depth to the soil and those volcanic loams are these rich red loams there. Um, but as you travel through the Yarra, um, there's this real interplay of different lava flows over, over the millennia. So mm-hmm. you'll see mm-hmm. not just red soils with, from, in a volcanic origin, you'll see also this brown and in some cases they'll overlap and intersect and, and you, you can see uh, what has happened over time. But but in terms of um, Wombat Creek specifically, it's this amazing red, almost purple um, volcanic loam, which, which goes forever. When you dig a soil pit there, it, it's really quite consistent in terms of that composition as you go down, um, which makes it incredible, you know, that if, as, as a you know, grape grower slash winemaker, um, the capacity mm-hmm. to really tap into those differences and see how they evolve when when you might have the same clone from a similar age, uh, you you just get this, obviously incredibly different wines coming off those two sites. In our journey back into the the glass, really, I wonder if you wouldn't just say something about your input, really, in terms of this wine. You know, in terms of what were the uh, yeah, what is the characteristic of of the winemaking itself and uh, yeah, give us an insight into um, what then happened when that fruit was, um, was, was transported to the winery. This, this is our range of wines. The tier for, in terms of regional selection, the idea really is to allow that um, fruit to express itself and very much not wanting to be too heavy handed in terms of what we do. Um, So that Mm -hmm. means we have less influence of things like new oak. Um, There'd be less influence of things like whole bunch um, and and really trying to get that level of purity um, coiled around mm. the fabric of that wine to to really show us what a Yarra Pinot is all about. Um, so so that means we're um, destemming, uh, we're fermenting it for about two weeks, uh, and then pressing. And it's it's in reality probably got about a twenty percent um, new French oak um, uh, element in that wine, and that's something that would change as we looked at those those other. Um, tiers in the portfolio in terms of um, the the new oak component and things like that. Uh, as we're recording at uh, eight o'clock um, for me over here, uh, <laughs> I, I thought it would, <laughs> I thought it would, um, yeah, do do the wines justice um, to actually try them last night. So you know, I did I did open all of these uh, three wines last night as well, and. and um, I think what's really interesting as, as is, has been really the evolution. You know, I, I, I do think that it's certainly, if you like, out of the gate. I, I did really get those those primary um, mm-hmm. fruit characteristics that you're you're talking about. But I think it's also, you know, it, it, it's fantastic to see that there are, uh, yeah, there are some of those other more detailed, you know, yeah. perhaps more, um, you know, looking to the to the volcanic um, nature to the um, the geography to 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 the to two very different sites there. I think think there are very um, sort of yeah insightful characteristics that are then coming out in in the wine, and, and um, it's great to know that it is you know as you say it is the wine, and it, it isn't it isn't something that's um, come in after the the kind of fruit's been picked. There's as you say that very very light influence from the oak, but very much it feels as though those. <laughs> 
sites that you pick from have been given room to express themselves and, and really to shine through. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. I think, uh, I think, and I think it's an important um, notion in terms of, um, well, for myself, but also handpicked because ultimately when we are making these wines from those different uh, regions and vineyards, we don't really want it to reflect the hand of me. Um, mm. It really needs to be expressive of where it comes from. Otherwise, um, the project fails. <laughs> Otherwise, they all look the same. Um, yeah. And I think that's that's probably the importance also of not necessarily coming to these wines with a, a specific rule or about how we will make the wine in our mind because obviously you have to adjust to a vintage variation and, and all those other sorts of things as well. I completely love those descriptions that you're given there, Peter. I, I think, again, this is where I get, you know, I guess really drawn into a wine where I can understand you know a lot more about who's made it where it's being made and and again you know those those longer term fascinating um inputs you know that mother nature really has, has has kind of given us um and i think what we've done here very well in terms of the selection of wine is actually then choosing a chardonnay that's a, a single vineyard and is, is coming from wombat creek so you know, I just really invite you to, you know, build on everything that you've described there. You know, we know the geology, we know what it looks like up there at Wombat Creek. Take us into then, yeah, the the Chardonnay block and and maybe talk to uh, maybe some slight differences from the the Pinot site, and then yeah, take us on that journey of how this thing gets into the bottle. So, in terms of the Wombat site, the the Pinot and the Chardonnay are planted uh, pretty much right on top of each other. So. Um, Site-wise, very similar in terms of slope, aspect, altitude, uh, and and vine age also. So this is a, a block planted mm. in the late eighties, and I think really to give you that the concept of the the background DNA for the site and the block. As I mentioned, when when it was originally planted in the late eighties, um, it was it was deemed to be the back of beyond from a Yarra Valley perspective, and the focus at that mm. point really was on um, sparkling production and that was inherently because it had that coolness of of climate for that site so it really had that um, tension and tautness and, and really crisp and crunchy acidity were inherent um, to the fruit coming from the site over the last few decades uh, I think we've, we've certainly seen that creep in terms of um, of ripening and temperature and all those things which now makes it achievable to be looking at these same blocks as table wine. Uh, and I think what's interesting is it's still definitely got that tension and that backbone and that drive, uh, which comes from that acidity. Um, but we are seeing this this nuance of, of, of what comes with the vine age in terms of um, that depth of flavour. And it's something, you know, that probably... Well, it really blows me away in many ways, just the power of the, the fruit that, that, that does that. It's iClone Chardonnay uh, and, you know, in a general sense, that's a clone that probably divides the room a little bit. It's, at times can be tropical um, down lower in the valley uh, and there'll be winemakers who, who don't like it and there'll be winemakers that do. I think in terms of what we see from Wombat, it's a completely different spectrum of fruit. Um, so really, I think it's got this amazing sort of zesty lemon highlight um, and lovely um, lift and, and, and fragrance of sort of white blossom behind that. Um, this is seeing a little bit more oak than the regional selection as we, we touched on when we tasted that. Um, but it's mm. seeing about 30% new and it's um, punching. So we're really, um, in my mind, Trying to combine that 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 larger format barrel with um, with that real power of of fruit, but also the acidity, and and to me that really really promotes that sort of elongation and length of flavour in the wine. So we really sort of see that that push and and flow of flavour and phenolic paired with the acidity there. The Chardonnay is on the north facing of the slopes. The west facing uh, is is planted completely. To Pinot in an original sense. Um, mm. One of the things that we've done since acquiring 
the property in 17 is actually try to think a little bit for the future too with with change mm. uh, and how to ensure we get that that length of um, um, production of, of really fine table wine. So we've actually planted a block of Chardonnay, which is completely opposite to all of that, which is on a more southern-facing slope, um, thinking that that will give us that um, coolness of sight for the, the decades to come. And we've taken um, some newer clones. There's a, a Dijon clone called 548 that we've put in there, um, along with some of the Dijon clone 76, which... There is a tiny little portion of 76 already planted which uh, was in those original plantings and it really struck me that it was it was quite a powerful um, little component of fruit. So we've replicated that in the, that planting mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. For me, it's really exciting because we see, as, a, as I've said, that, that layer and complexity with vine age which, which perhaps becomes more important than clone over the really long length of time but I think in terms mm. of what we're seeing from those new blocks, um, something like 548 just is this um, amazing clone. I think it's really going to energise the, the, the future single vineyard wines uh, for, for this particular wine in, in the pretty near future. Very cool. And, uh, yeah, it's always uh, good to have my northern hemisphere orientation yeah, switched around as well because yeah, yeah, the, sure. you're, you, yeah exactly you're, 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 you're saying that these are planted as I learned on the sun side um, yeah. but then you've, you've then now to adapt for future climate change you've, you've, you've gone onto the, onto the shade side so um, mm. yeah if you know as I say that's, <laughs> that's maybe just me but uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, yeah, interesting to, <laughs> to, to, to know that it's, everything is sort of yeah, reversed Peter, I'm, I'm loving these descriptions. And I think, you know, one thing that we haven't really so much touched on is how different vintages have the interplay. I mean, you, you've spoken about the sort of, yeah, the, the broader strokes really around, uh, around the, this, this particular site. And I think, you know, using this wine, um, looking at Wombat Creek and looking at Chardonnay, um, given that we've got a 2018 here, I wonder if you wouldn't mind saying something about that particular vintage Sure. Um, you know yeah. what were yeah some of the some of the sort of unique um, points around that vintage what what points were sort of um, similar to other vintages and yeah we can then also kind of yeah follow that path back into the glass and see how that turns up I mean it's an interesting question and I think it's it's probably particularly pertinent from a Wombat Creek point of view because um, being the highest site in the Yarra it probably really does accentuate the impact of vintage variation, you know, it's it's a little bit more extreme in terms of weather cycles. Uh, it's it's probably one of the later ripening parcels of Chardonnay in the valley because effectively it is so high. Um, you know, this is one of the parts of the valley where in winter it would snow on the cold days, which would be, um, I mean, next to unheard of at the actual vineyard in Hybo Hill. You might see it on the ranges around you. Mm. Um, but so there's that real difference there and, and it probably means you're a bit more exposed to um, a tougher vintage and that vintage variation. In terms of 2018 itself, um, we were ultimately very, very happy with with um, the way the vintage turned out. So I wouldn't suggest that that was one of those years where we had a, a really hard time. That was a vintage which was marked by um, quite a, a cool and moist um, winter and spring. Uh, and at Wombat Creek, that would be particularly so. Um, so, you know, as I said, the, we would often see rainfall over a metre there in a given year. Um, the thing with that site is that it, because it's on that volcanic loam, um, it's not necessarily something that concerns us because it's also incredibly free draining soil profile. So we tend to see it soak in. Uh, and, and because it's quite a steep hillside, it tends to also um, flow off and, and, and go down to the dam um, quite well. Um, so really what that did was set us up for the summer, which um, often is the pretty classic Australian summer, which means that um, as it was in 2018, as we came into that pre-Christmas period, it really dried off quite noticeably and mm -hmm. um, that saw 
quite a sort of hot season um, kick into gear at that point. Um, and then it actually became very dry. Um, so that's where I think um, having a site like Wombat Creek with those really good moisture retention uh, and, and that coolness of site meant I think you can definitely see some of that warmth of the year that's there. Um, mm-hmm. I would say something like 2017 was a bit more finely chiselled in terms of the acidity. Um, but I think um, um, still you get that sense of, of, of where you are in the arrow being up high and cooler and, and, um, and, and therefore that backbone of acidity. Again, talking to the evolution of, of this wine, I mean, I think um, you know, I'll be including uh, below all of the, the, the links to information and text sheets about the wine. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, having opened this uh, particular wine last night and, and, and tried it, it, it again, it, it has evolved. I mean, I think that you know, certainly the, the, uh, maybe the, the oak was maybe you know, more, more present for me when I, when I first opened the, the bottle and, and that kind of struck match characteristic as well. Yeah. Um, and it just feels as though really, yeah, overnight and, uh, in, in the, in the fridge and, and, uh, you know, those elements have all just really come together and, and it just feels like, you know, such a, a harmonious wine, I would say. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's, yeah, again, super interesting to, to hear all of those different inputs into, you know, the different clonal selection and the site selection, but, you know, ultimately it, it sits in the, in the glass, very balanced, which, are, you know, I, I think, and I hope is one of the best compliments you can ever give to a no, winemaker. Is that all I, of the, it's, um, yeah. I actually really love hearing other people talk about my wine. Cause I think as a winemaker, in some ways you can end up in a bubble where, you know, you, mm. if you don't hear too often, you get this sort of preconceived idea of what your mind might, wine might look like. And I think, um, mm. yeah, it, it's an interesting one. I mean, um, and it, the struck match is an interesting one too, because that is something I actually really love in the wine. Mm. Um, mm. And wombat often, that to me, that's it's obviously a sulfide characteristic in a chemical sense, but but wombat often will have that that vein of sulfide there, and I think fundamentally mm-hmm. for me it just makes me think of great Chardonnay. So I, I'm always happy mm-hmm. to see that sort of evolve and 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 come yeah. in and out of the wine over time. Um, the 18 is also, you know, it's not fined or or anything like that. So I think it really gives you that true window into um, what 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 the vineyard does. As somebody once uh, described to me, you, you you get different looks at that as as the wine yeah. opens up and kind of evolves as well. As you know, it's not yeah. one of those sort of static wines that never that no, never change. I always like that characteristic because I think it it just reminds you that you know it's it's kind of a living thing you know it's actually it comes from grapes it comes from a place and actually you know those things and and those characteristics are are always changing and i think it's nice to reflect that even when you've got the glass in front of you really loving yeah the wines and and the descriptions and i think you know as we come to the third and final wine for today i think it also gives us a really interesting insight into you know your portfolio of wines because we're now going to move to a, a different part of Australia. We're going to move down to the Mornington Peninsula. So I wonder again if, you know, we, we sort of, yeah, pull back from the wine and pull back from the geology, maybe just talk to us about the geography. So, you know, introduce the wine and, and, and talk around, you know, standing out in those different vineyards where the fruit is coming from, kind of what are we seeing and what is the sense of that location? The third wine is uh, actually a Mornington Peninsula wine, and this is the tier that sits between regional and the individual vineyard. So this is called Collection. Um, the difference in terms of a geographical sense, we've come from being an hour to the uh, northeast of the Melbourne city, and we've actually now driven south um, mm-hmm. um, by about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, and Mornington instead of being continental in, in terms of Yarra is slightly inland, Mornington is very much a maritime climate. So really here we're surrounded by, on a peninsula, surrounded by water on three sides. So we've got Port Phillip Bay, which sits just off Melbourne itself. Uh, to our south we've got basically the Bass Strait, 
Um, and the south is really where the main weather systems will come in if we kept going. Um, if you're lucky, you might hit Tasmania, but if you didn't, you'd end up in Antarctica. So that's the, the engine room for a lot of our really big weather systems that, that would come up um, from that direction. And on the other side of the peninsula to our east is Western Port. Um, and what that means is as a, as a region, it really tempers the highs and lows of temperature um, because w- mm. what will happen on, in a hot summer's day, which is about that time that the, the fruit is really uh, ripening, um, you'll tend to have um, the wind coming from one of those three directions. So it's flowing across those bodies of water, which really gives us that cooling mm-hmm. capacity uh, and really drops the temperatures a bit. The exception is if there's a hot northerly, obviously in that case it will be not too much you can do about it. And what, what to me uh, that does is it gives these um, the wines of Mornington this lovely sort of vibrancy and, and freshness. Um, but equally, um, in particularly for this this wine, where we sit in Mornington is um, is closer to Western Port Bay itself. Uh, so that's where the Capella site is and, and the winery. And Mornington, as I mentioned earlier, is this tiny region. It's only a thousand hectares planted, um, but it actually looks a bit, um, again, quite volcanic in its in its sort of DNA. And and if you look at a map of the geology, it actually looks like there's a sort of the cone of the volcano sitting in the middle. It's not quite that simple mm-hmm. in terms of how it was formed, but but really you can go in a very short distance um, over the space of five, ten kilometres, you can go from being almost at sea level, like us here at 25 metres, mm-hmm. up to 300 mm-hmm. plus metres. Um, and that gives us this really big um, difference in characteristics that come um, from a winemaking point of view from, from the different sites that are, that are spread across the peninsula. Um, we also will see a big difference in terms of that geography as you've come down the hill from, from Wombat Creek in the heavy and, and dense uh, forest. Uh, you know, Mornington is quite an interesting landscape. It, it, when I remember the first time I drove into the peninsula, it really r- reminded me in mm. many ways of almost like a, um, a, a an English landscape. There was, it's a very, it tends to be quite green and lush, a lot of those sort of rolling green paddocks um there's a lot of pine tree sort of rows and all those sorts of things spread around the peninsula um so it's a very different landscape to yarra um but i think um you know equally diverse in terms of that range of of soils and sites and and nuances in terms of characteristics we get in the final wines so in terms of mornington peninsula itself uh i think it's you know, we could really drill into it and look at it in um, quite complex ways. But I think in, in simple terms, what people will often do in breaking it down is describe it as up the hill and down the hill. And what that really mm-hmm. means is up the hill tends to be a volcanic loam, uh, you know, slightly different to what we've talked about from a Wombat Creek point of view, but ultimately still that degraded volcanic loam Um we have mm-hmm. one site that we, we run up the hill, which sort of sees uh, actually the intermingling of, of different colours of volcanic loam. But what people mean by um, down the hill tends to be um, some form of sandy loam sitting on top of a, a clay bed. And in terms of uh, hand-picked itself, we, we take fruit from different sites, um, but, but ultimately Capella itself is really just sitting off the edge of Western Port, and that's putting us down the hill on what you, on mm. technically what you'd call a Muradak clay, but that is ultimately a, a sandy loam. So you can see uh, some of those sands have come in, um, which are basically windborne sands, um, and it's sitting on this really quite um, quite thick layer, humic layer, uh, and, and then we have this beautiful loam sitting on top of a clay. Uh, and what, what, what we see in general uh, as a factor of that is you tend to um, see more of those darker fruit spectrum coming through uh, from this part of Mornington um, as compared to up the hill is, is tending to be a little bit finer uh, and tighter and, and more perfumed. Um, but I think what that means we see down here is this wonderful power um, to the wine. So I, I still see it as a... As, a fine and elegant style of Pinot, but really 
um, it's, it's, it's got this sort of generosity and vibrancy uh, that's there in the fruit. Um, the 19 uh, is the follow-up on the 18. The 18 actually won the um, Australian Pinot Noir Challenge, um, which was the inaugural challenge, and the 19 uh, topped the Mornington section in that. So they, they have some history um, in, in doing well and being well received. Um, and, and I think that comes back to that, that real vibrancy of character. I think that really makes it sort of stand out in, in the lineup of Pinots. So in terms of the collection range, it, it tends to be a little bit um, varied, but in terms of this specific one, the collection Mornington from 2019, uh, we have a number of parcels from different blocks um, and we try to treat them in different ways. So I might have some 114 clone, I might have some MV6, um, and I don't have a uniform way of making those wines or, or treating those parcels. Um the bulk of this is de-stemmed and, and then cold soaked and then fermented for about 14 days, uh, then pressed and, and goes to barrel. Um, there's some quite small parcels in here. We have some pretty small blocks. So there's a mix of barrel size depending on the size of the parcel. So uh, probably about one third was in barrique and two thirds in puncheon. Um, and then there's also some of those components. I tend to use a bit of whole bunch with um, some of the clones like the 115 as I think that just really, to me, that can be quite perfumed from particularly from this Capella site and it really kind of elevates um, that, that, that lift of fragrance and perfume um, in terms of that component of the, the final blend. Uh, and I think just as a slight nuance in terms of that finesse of tannin uh, at the end. In my mind, just trying to be mindful of where where those wines are sitting in terms of the the portfolio, and perhaps what what the endpoint might be. So, it, it could well be true that ninety percent of the wines are purchased and taken home and drunk on the day of purchase. But I think we, in my mind, we still try to to make it. Um, to be reflective of where it's coming from, but equally to also, in a collection sense, probably have a little bit more generosity, a little bit more flesh and a little bit more um, immediacy that's there. I mean, I, th I still think the wine will sell it very well, but, it, but it's got that, mm. that generosity there. In terms of the single vineyard wines, they probably tend to be maybe built for the long road. So I think they tend to um, probably have that little extra nuance of um, tension and, and energy and acidity, um, perhaps a little bit more um, bolder tannin, all those sorts of things. And I think uh, in my mind that's probably just setting them apart in terms of sellerability and, and all those sorts of things in the long term. Again, I think you're making my job very easy here because, um, you know, absolutely – I love the the descriptions you're giving, and um, you know you you kind of virtually transported me to to the Mornington and uh, you know to the vineyard and 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 really through that through that process. And and I, but I think also yeah, you, you've given a really um, accurate insight into how this sits in the glass as well. And and as you absolutely say, you know super super approachable. Um, now in, in, in its kind of relative youth with, I think, yeah, a great cellaring potential. Um, and yeah, just a, another look at, at, at Pinot for me and, and, um, you know, translating that, that volcanic, um, soil, which, but as you say, generosity, I think that, that that's a really good word because it's, again, it's, it's still a very approachable wine. It's still a very drinkable wine. Um, and almost, you know, one where, if you go looking for different characteristics, then you can absolutely find them. But I think also, um, yeah, just also just really enjoyable, you know, which I think mm. is, uh, you know, sometimes something that we, we don't talk enough about in, in terms of wine consumption, just, yeah, it's mm. uh, no, you know, what I call a, 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 a smiley wine as well. You know, it's kind of, you have it and it puts a smile on your face, <laughs> not a, not a technical term, <laughs> but I think also just really important, you know, wines that are just, um, you know, delicious and, and, uh, just really, you know, enjoyable experience to drink and to, and to think about the food pairings. <laughs> 
Yeah, and it is interesting too because I think there is that third dimension in terms of of, of when you try a wine and, and that might be emotive or you might feel there's an energy there or it, you transcend to a different place or, a, a, you know, a, a past memory of some time that reminds mm-hmm. you of drinking a different wine with someone else or at a different place. or And, and to me that's that um, part of the joy of wine that is, you know, not necessarily – Black and white, or um, or or scientifically provable in any way, shape, or form, but but nonetheless, what makes wine so enjoyable? I've really loved, you know, talking and and, and really, you know, delving in in some depth into into these three wines. And and uh, again, I will um, in the in the show notes below, I'll I'll be linking these particular wines and also just you know linking the handpicked website where people can. Uh, I guess, sort of orientate these wines within the the broader portfolio. One of the things that I like to hear about, and I know that the audience loves to hear about as well, is viticulture. And, it, and it's something that we haven't really touched on too much so far. Um, and I think that given how the company operates, and, and really my understanding is that you, you're, you tend to be taking over and, and purchasing vineyards that have been in existence for some time and where there's been a, you know, a previous viticulturalist on site. I'd love to know a bit about, and potentially through some examples, you know, what are some of the changes that, that, that you've made in those vineyards when you take them over and when you want them to, as we say, fully express the terroir and, and the area in which they're located? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's a, I, a question I love because I think, you know, my title is winemaker uh, and, and that's what I think so many people think um that that making wine starts when you you take the grapes and you start doing things at the winery for me obviously the reality is if we want to make the great wines we have to really get it right in the vineyard um and i think you know we we obviously spend a lot of time trying to find great sites and therefore once we arrive we have to think about what is it we might do differently what is it we we can change, and I think ultimately um, the reason we've bought the site is because it has demonstrated the potential to make great wine. So we we know there's that there, um, and that that that's probably you know got lots of different layers to it as to why that may or may not be. Um, but I think at that point, really, there's that you know concept of trying to be the custodian of that site and and take it to a point where when you leave, it's in a better place. Uh, and I think, you know, in many ways that it comes back to that concept of vine health. Um, so as a business, we've gone down the path of accreditation for organics and that's that's well underway. Even prior to going down that path officially, you know, that was in the background in terms of the philosophy that we we're implementing. Um, but But our first sites will be accredited in August this year. Um, but I think really, you know, I think possibly some of the, the, the better examples beyond that is, is really simple things where um, just how we prune the vines has such a big impact on that longevity uh, and overall health of the vine. So I think, you know, a good example there is, is, is in the concept of pruning. Um, we've really um, thought carefully about how to approach it and, and we've gone down a path which is based on the teachings of a Frenchman called Poussart. Um, and his sort of philosophy, um, it's quite interesting, you know, what's old is new again, uh, was actually described in a book um, published by a guy called René Lafon uh, in 1921. Uh, and that uh, was based around the concepts of sap flow um, and that being fundamental to, to vine health um, and overall longevity and, and, and age of the vine. And, you know, in recent times, um, those ideas have really been embraced by the guys at Simone and Search and they're um, based out of Italy, but, but they've really worked hard on a global scale. I'm sure plenty of people have probably heard of them before um, and, and, and they really um, are pushing what will ultimately be, a, in essence, a very similar um, uh, process. And what it means is for the team, we really had to 
take a step back and, and unlearn what we'd learned previously where um, in a pruning sense with all our premium blocks, um, historically people would look for a cane and that would be their first selection and then they would choose um, spurs mm. from there. Um, the problem with that being that um, the cane is, is something that is there for one year, whereas the spur is setting up the fabric um, for those grapevines for the future. Um, and in terms of sap flow, this, this concept is built around the idea that you want to see consistent sap flow down both sides of the grapevine um, as it then um, comes onto the wire. And I probably uh, won't go into too much detail trying to, to, to talk about it in, in a podcast because it risks um, confusing it, but, uh, but for me quite a fascinating exercise. And, and the other key thing is to really avoid making big cuts and, and what we've mm-hmm. seen in this process is um, by changing this, you know, reversing the way we approach the, the pruning of the vine, um, it actually makes it simpler and quicker for the team, but you can see much less big cuts and that, that, that flow uh, is really consistent within the vines. And, and we've seen a really quite amazing response and, and um, ultimately... Um, I think that's probably one of the really key sort of steps in terms of things that we're doing. And, and an example would be for someone who finds grapevines that have had really big historical cuts and you see these really gnarled um, sort of wound points, if you take those vines and you cut them in half um, down the length of the trunk and you split it open, you'll see that where there was that cut, there's this dead timber tissue and it extends right down into the trunk. And, and really that's what mm. we're trying to avoid. We're trying to have that, that health and vigour up the entirety of the trunk as much as possible. So I think um, that, that really is a key step um, in terms of ensuring this, that sort of energy and vitality in the vineyard for the long term. Uh, outside of that, there's, there's um, lots of what um, is probably becoming more and more commonplace, I think, in, in, in a general vineyard philosophy um, but, but things we've been um, doing for a little while now, uh, we've done a huge amount of work on things like mulching undervine, um, really trying to, mm-hmm. to build um, the humic layer there uh, and extending that to doing things like um, compost teas where really uh, looking at um, promoting the healthy microbes that are present in that what is effectively a monocultural crop, trying to get that diversity there. Um, so mm-hmm. by um, by aerating um, almost like a giant tea bag in a container over the space of 24 to 48 hours, we get this uh, compost tea. And we're actually promoting this really healthy um, microbial activity within that solution, which we then um, can choose to use in different ways. It might be broadcast on the entire vineyard, it could be focused on parts of the canopy, and we, we try to mix that up through the course of the year. Um, so all those little steps, I think, sort of come together in the bigger picture. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, there's things like thinking about our cover crops. Um, cover crops are probably used by plenty of people. We try to really tailor our cover crops to the, the different blocks. So, um, for instance, there's mm-hmm. a, a particular block at Capella where... Um, it had a, a particular issue with soil compaction and we went really heavily in the, the mix of seeds um, that we were using there with the, like a daikon radish. Um, and you can imagine, a, you know, you go to the Chinese supermarket, you buy the daikon, it's this huge um, underground mm. root. Uh, and what that's doing is effectively... Um, saving us having to find other ways to mechanically aerate that soil because the the root is then growing and then over time will die and you end up with a channel of air in, in the soil, things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So and I think that's what I, I really love about um, this style of viticulture is, you know, there's this lovely sense of logic and, and common sense to it. Um, you've just got to sort of take that time to sort of step back and... Um, and find those solutions. Um, you know, we, we talk about things like biodiversity in what is a mono, 
crop. So um, the vines are obviously not going to change anytime soon. We really try to mix up the um, the different um, plants uh, and, and types of plants that are in the mid rows and, and alternate them from year to year. Uh, the use of things like beehives, where um, in uh, in the flowering, that, that's sort of a critical point which can make or break a vineyard in terms of the, the final crop level, the success of that uh, transition of the inflorescence to a pollinated flower. Uh, and uh, in a in a year where you have bad weather, you will have sticky caps uh, where they're not falling off to allow that that blossom to be pollinated properly. And there's evidence to suggest that if you've got a healthy bee population, they'll be in there squirreling away and they'll actually help by knocking those caps mm-hmm. off, uh, things like that. So, um, you know, we, we go heavily in terms of uh, we lo- work with a local beekeeper to really boost um, the, the bee population um, through that time of year. Uh, and then we have a couple of resident beehives of the year for the balance of the year. Really love all of these examples, and uh, you know, I know that um, yeah, Australia itself has, has has been a you know a great lead in in terms of permaculture, working with nature, um, mm. and yeah, getting getting in tune with nature and getting the you know as you say the bees and and the microbes to 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 help you you know to to kind yeah. of all work in this um, same direction, and uh, you know, I just think that kind of intentional agriculture as and as you you know rightly say biodiversity within a, a monoculture i think that's a really interesting way to put it um i think you know all of the things there and i'm sure we we're, we're, we're just scraping the surface really in terms of what you what you do and what you think about and what you um you know will do in the future mm. um i just think yeah we could talk for a while on this one <laughs> <laughs> yeah no exactly just i think it just shows one how many different windows in to the world of wine there is i think this is this is why um so many people get get hooked on 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 wine and 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 it's you know not not just about the the great tasting wine in the glass it's it's about what goes into into kind of making that and kind of how deep the 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 daikan radish hole <laughs> you you want to go um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then what i also love is and um as we kind of move towards closing what i also love is that you know people that just want to have the wine and just want to sit down and have a you know a, a nice glass of wine with their friends which is of course totally cool people can go down that route as well and um yeah, you know we, we we kind of started off with you mentioning around you know the urban cellar door and bringing these wines to people in sydney and, and to melbourne and you know we are um in the lead up now to the london wine fair which is where Handpicked wines are going to be showing for the for the first ever time, and um, you know I'm very honoured to I think be one of the first people in London and in England to to get to try these wines. And um, I wonder just to, yeah if, if in closing um, you wouldn't mind sort of you know looking ahead to the fair, maybe uh, mentioning which wines are going to be showed there, and 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 again maybe talking to hopefully a, a bright future with these wines showing up in the UK and being able to be tasted by my audience who are based over here. In terms of the London Wine Fair itself, we're, uh, we're in the Wines Unearth section at stand X114A uh, and obviously looking uh, very much forward to, to seeing how people receive the wines. Uh, in terms of the wines on pour, we have the three wines that we've talked through uh, today uh, and in addition to that, we also have the 2021 uh, regional selection Mornington Pinot Gris, uh, along with the 2015 uh, number series wine, which is the number one Shiraz. And number series we touched on in terms of the portfolio at mm-hmm. the start. Mm-hmm. Um, that is uh, wines that we um, really are quite unique. We only make them in tiny quantities. Uh, and only made from really quite special parcels of fruit in in an exceptional vintage. Uh, so yeah, I think it should be a, a pretty exciting opportunity to get to the stand and 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 try that particular wine uh, along with the others. I really appreciate the time to talk this evening, Lawrence. So thank you for having me on. And I, I guess ultimately. Uh, we are obviously really excited about the next couple of weeks with London Wine Fair 
uh, on and the, and the chance to show and share our wines um, with the UK, which is a, which is obviously a new market, but one that I know uh, really appreciates uh, things like the the wines that we love, particularly things like Chardonnays and Pinots and uh, and and everything else. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I hope people have a chance to to get down there and, and try the wines. And you know, in the the long term, we're obviously very open and happy to uh, to talk about opportunities that arise out of that. A huge thank you to you, Peter, for your time and insight into a really exciting tailwild driven project. Your passion really shines through, and even though this is a super in-depth episode, I feel like we're just scraping the surface of your growing sights and approach to winemaking. If you know someone who would enjoy this episode, then please do share the direct link, which is interpretingwine.com slash 471. And to really show your appreciation, please leave the episode an iTunes review on the same link, which really helps people find Interpreting Wine in episodes like this. Do check out Handpicked Wines online at handpickedwines.com.au from where you can find their main social media handles and learn more about the project. As mentioned last time on the podcast, I'm going to be at the London Wine Fair from June 7th to June 9th. So do say hi if you're also going to be there. And of course, stop by the Handpicked Wine Stands in Wines Unearthed to Taste. And of course, I'd love to have you following along with me on social media, where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter, and email hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time.